Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's edition of Tech About Live. We have a very, very, very special conversation, which I believe will be enlightening and will be very informative for, for informative for everyone who is on the call today. My name is Cora Mane Corrie. I am Tech About Managing Editor, and I have with us today um, a couple of very, very, very interesting high-level people both from the IFC and Jumia as well. So I'd just like to uh, briefly just call out their names before I get to some housekeeping. The first um, chairwoman, Juliet Anama, um, she's chairwoman of Jumia, uh, Jumia Nigeria and the group chief um, sustainability officer. We have Anne here as well. She is the regional, regional gender lead um, Africa at IFC. We have Alexa Roscoe here, and we have Ms. Bukola as well, who is an entrepreneur and Jumia merchant. And today we're going to be speaking about how increasing women participation can grow e-commerce in Africa. Uh, so first, let's just briefly talk about Techabal and you know what we do. Techabal speaks to both the business and human impact of technology and innovation in Africa. Techabal is a pan-African media publication. We report stories about technology and business in Africa. Um, we do this by providing high-quality articles, reports, and events such as this one. We also publish the Tech About Daily Newsletter, which is a comprehensive roundup of tech news and events across Africa. A subscription link, if you're not subscribed to our newsletter, it goes out every weekday morning at 7 a.m. If you're not subscribed, the chat room moderator will put a link below and you can um, check it out. You can also read past editions on our website under the newsletter section. This event is organized by Techabout Insights or TC Insights. TC Insights is Techabout's data, research, and intelligence unit, which provides actionable data on startups and the tech ecosystem across Africa to uh, an interesting uh, group of people, including investors, entrepreneurs, big tech companies, both on the continent, outside the continent, regulators, and other players as well. So the event will go like this. We're going to have a conversation with the panelists here, everybody you can see here, um, for about 45 minutes. And then we're going to have a Q&A session as well. So you are welcome to ask questions in the Q&A box. Um, some of these questions will be answered live. If the panelists wish to do so, they can also respond to the questions while the conversation is going on. Um, our chat room moderator is Sultan Quadri. He's a staff writer at Techabal, and he'll also be sharing some housekeeping rules, including where to ask questions, what type of questions to ask, and just ensuring that everyone knows what to do. Uh, so now I'm going to hand over to Mercy Wanju. Wan Zhao, I'm sorry, I say Wan Zhao, Wan Zhao. Um, she's Director, Legal and Board Advisory Communications Authority, Kenya, and she's going to give us our opening remarks. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're listening in uh, from. Let me take an early opportunity to really say how delighted I am to speak at this event. Coming in January and at the very end of the month, I think this is a great opportunity to give us 11 months to work at the commitments that are going to be made in this kind of very useful discussion. Uh, let me recognize IFC and Tech Cabal for this invitation, and I'm really looking forward to the panel uh, discussions. As I start with my opening remarks, I recognize something provocative and something that's really, really sad, that there is a digital disconnect. Coming in year 2022, when so much progress has been made in connectivity around the world, even in Africa, there is still a digital disconnect when you look at the situation from a gender lens. Why is this the case? This is because the places where development and women's empowerment are most needed are the same places where women almost have no access to the internet. 
we know that today uh, the internet is a gateway to huge economic opportunities. So with women having no access to the same internet or devices that would allow that, then really there is a digital disconnect and a denial of opportunity right there. This is particularly in uh, low and middle income countries where as we all know, the internet is usually through the mobile phone. And well, for us who are gathered here, um, internet access is commonplace. We take classes on the internet, we do online shopping, we watch movies, we do online banking. This is really a strange event for many of the world's uh, women today uh, to access the internet or even become a mobile phone user. This low level of access is mainly attributed to inability to afford a handset, the lack of literacy and lack of digital skills. These factors combined with cultural norms and the many responsibilities that women have had to shoulder, particularly in this COVID pandemic, just make it very difficult, uh, very problematic for women to participate and participate uh, meaningfully. As a result of that kind of situational background, despite the deepening of digital transformation in Africa, it is obvious that digital is not synonymous with connectivity. It is also therefore obvious that a vast majority of women in Africa are still left behind, despite the fact that E-Trade has continued to change the face and the futures of many around the world. However, this digital gender gap that I have highlighted in my background continues to play onwards into the e-commerce space. Because the truth is, if you have no mobile phone, then you do not know how to use a mobile phone, most likely. If you have no access to the internet, then you will not engage in trade in the online space. You're absent. I know this sounds like a sorry story, but I think all is not lost because for many studies that have been done, there's a recent IFC report that shows the kind of economic um, benefits that would come uh, out of this. And the conversation is about what are the strategies, the policy and regulatory innovations that should be put in place to change this trend and ensure that it comes to happen because e-commerce indeed is a catalyzer for bridging the digital gap. And in my view, it provides the best platform for women to grow their businesses. Because of this, women actually should be the heart of this matter. Women should be at the center of these conversations. How can this be achieved? This can be achieved through several innovations, policy and legislative um, innovations, business innovations and enablements. But of course, policymakers and regulators or what I would call the face of government cannot do it alone is the need for collaboration across the board, for governments to collaborate with investors, e-commerce platforms, development organizations, so that a multi-stakeholder approach will lead to a multi-pronged approach and multiple solutions to tackle this issue. Indeed, these collaborations are not just restricted to national level. These go beyond boundaries because e-commerce is also about transboundary transactions and therefore the need for not just national collaboration, but international and regional uh, collaboration. I'd like to pose two questions which will be questions that apply across the board because indeed we do recognize that our demographics in Africa are different. Our issues may be different. Our consumer needs may be different. However, if the effort be the need to enhance inclusivity of e-commerce, there are some questions that will apply across the board. The first question is to ask, how are women participating in e-commerce? This question cuts across. The second question is, are advances in digital uh, 
in, digi in disruptive digital technology, translating into advances in gender equity. As you and I know, the responses to that are likely to be less than satisfactory across the board. So what are the proposals that I would be making from a policy and regulatory perspective? And I have four of them, and I will just mention them because I believe this is the first of many conversations to be had on this issue. The first is the need to have and adopt inclusive legislation to address the e-commerce ecosystem whether it is on digital trade policies, enactment on ICT policies to ensure that no one is left behind. Two, the adoption of inclusive finance. It is known that women often have a real struggle to access finance. And the proposal is that uh, initiatives would be found to reduce costs of financing to micro, small and medium enterprises to establish a credit reference system for them and make payment more convenient. The third one would be adoption of inclusive logistics. This extends to the point of establishing national addressing systems because for e-commerce to be successful, the address to where the good is expected to arrive at becomes more critical now than ever before and much of Africa still needs to evolve its addressing systems to increase logistics efficiency by enhancing ground, air, rail, and human networks. And fifthly, to adopt inclusive technological development by allowing for digital skills and allowing for the utilization of universal service funds so that this is able to extend to the entire population. As I close, I will speak to a quote by Fela Durotoy, that individual effort is good. My effort, your effort, they are good, but collective action is better. We need a network of nation builders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mercy. That was really insightful. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, I am now going to hand over to Alexa Roscoe. She is the Disruptive Technology Lead, and she's going to also give us a, 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 a brief, excuse me, keynote speech as well. Um, so yes, Alexa, you're up next. Great, well, well, thank you. And I'm delighted to get us started and to build on Mercy's remarks by sharing some of IFC's latest research, um, the first ever report on women in e-commerce. And I'm particularly excited to be sharing this with the Tech Cabal audience, um, because I know there are so many women entrepreneurs and digital entrepreneurs with us today. So, you know, as I go through this, I'd love to hear from the people in the audience in the chat, what does this world look like for you and your markets? Does our, what we're sharing in today in this report ring true? Um, and, or what's, di what's different in your kind of lived lives? Um, so next slide, please. Um, and I'm particularly excited to share with this audience because you know the what we really found at IFC is the future of e-commerce is absolutely in emerging markets. And in Africa alone, the sector is expected to quadruple by 2030. And that was an estimate that was pre-COVID. All signs during the pandemic really point to the fact that COVID has accelerated that trend as more and more people really are turned away for, to, to, to online means for some ways to deliver their businesses. Um, however, we really did this report because very limited research has considered how e-commerce impacts women entrepreneurs or how women business owners contribute to e-commerce markets. This is particularly important because women entrepreneurs already experience significant challenges offline. For instance, women small and medium business enterprise owners face an almost $1.5 trillion financing gap globally. And we wanted to know, does the emergence of digital models help overcome these barriers and the other types of barriers that Mercy walked us through? Or do existing gaps in digital and financial inclusion mean that the industries of the future risk leaving women behind? So we set out to close this gap by working with Jumia to get unique data on men and women entrepreneurs in three countries, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, and Nigeria. 
by combining company data, surveys of men and women vendors, and interviews with stakeholders across the sector, we are able to bring a unique view into women's participation in e-commerce, both during and prior to the pandemic. So as we go through this, there's one number that I really want you to keep in the forefront of your mind, and indeed I hope it sticks there to seeing it, um, which is $14.5 billion. This is the size of the opportunity for additional growth for the e-commerce market to close gender gaps just between 2025 and 2030. And we found that we can capture this growth in two ways. First, by recruiting more women into e-commerce, but second, to raising women's revenues so they're at parity with those of men. So let's start by looking at where women are now. So first, um, the really basic question, are women selling online? Um, and we compare the share of women on Jumia to the share of registered business own, women-owned businesses in the three countries studied. And we did, in fact, as you can see that this chart, the numbers in, in most of the countries Tend to, tend to be comparable. And that this itself is noteworthy because this is the first time any research has been able to show to what degree women entrepreneurs are selling online. Um, and that it's also noteworthy because it shows that women entrepreneurs are embracing selling online as a way to reach wider markets. Next slide. Um, however, one thing that, that popped out looking just beyond the participation numbers is that you know, women are online, but men and women are using e-commerce very differently. Um, to start with, their motivations are different. Um, like on the Jumia platform, women are more likely to report joining, joining online to grow an existing business, whereas men are more likely to join to start a completely new business, like so to be starting entrepreneurs. Um, this tells us that e-commerce is helping women entrepreneurs digitalize who are already in, you know, out there selling, but are really ambitious and looking for a way to grow. Um, but perhaps men are getting into the sector a little bit earlier than women might. Um, back, please. <laughs> We're not quite done. Um, so second point is that we really looked also at what women are selling. One of the challenges women face offline is that women tend to get stuck in low profit sectors. With e-commerce, we saw that women are entering sectors like electronics, which are high profit, but tend to be male dominated. So that, um, so for instance, a woman vendor in Nigeria told us that she had started off kind of selling in her local market, but all the other stores were surrounded by men. Um, and so she got pushed back around like, why was she there? Why was she selling? But when she went online, she could sell to everyone um, and no one you know, knew who owned the business. Um, the third point here is that you know, met, women are particularly valuing the training and business support offered by platforms. Even though we saw that men and women had similar comfort levels with the platform, women are really ambitious. They wanted the training to be able to grow and thrive. And they saw that as one of the key value adds of the platform. So that tells us that platforms can really attract women by offering these services. Um, Lastly, another kind of key value add for women here is that um, some of the subtle things that are, are so important, like flexibility, reaching personal goals, being able to balance kind of their family care responsibilities. This really tells us that women are using e-commerce to overcome the challenges like, care, like disproportionate care that have really drastically increased during the pandemic. So all of these benefits are ways that, you know, just digitalizing businesses really clearly change the game for women entrepreneurs. However, there is a how however coming next. Um, so I think it will perhaps not surprise too many people online here um, that COVID really held women back. Um, so prior to the pandemic, we found, had found that women were actually begun, beginning to reach parity in sales with men, not in all countries, but at least some of the countries that we looked at. Um, however, when we hit 2020 and the pandemic, women's sales dropped. Um, and particularly, women's sales dropped 7%, while men's sales overall rose at the, at the same amount. Um, 
So that's that feels like a really kind of pessimistic story to tell. Um, and we've heard way too many pessimistic stories over the last year. But I think that's I actually have a more optimistic way of looking at it, which is that, you know, the things were looking pretty good before the pandemic. So that means it's actually possible and achievable and realistic to reverse the, the pandemic losses and get to that 15 billion dollars of growth that we talked about earlier. How do we do that? Next slide. Um, so I'm going to just touch quickly on, on five ways we can get there and this before, you know, handing over to some, the panel for some deeper um, conversation. Um, so the first is we need better data. We can't tell whether women on, are online, how they're participating, unless you're actually tracking which businesses are women owned or which businesses are male owned. So we're really you know, calling out to e-commerce businesses, really the private sector more broadly to make sure they're gathering good sex disaggregated data. Um, the second of course is recruit women into the sector. Um, there are markets like Kenya and Nigeria where women are almost at 50%, but then there are markets like Cote d'Ivoire where women are only about like a third of, of vendors. So that's where we really want to target getting more women into the sector. And particularly one way to do that is by bringing them over from social commerce. So like the Facebooks, the WhatsApps of the world where women tend to get their start. Um, the third is training and promotions. Um, as I said, there's um, women tend to value these services more than men. Um, however, we found that there are some areas um, where women aren't using as actively as men. And specifically, they're not using things like paid advertisements. And that can be a game changer in a very crowded marketplace online. So we really recommend targeting women for areas that will help them use e-commerce strategically. Um, the fourth is high value sectors. As I touched upon, let's get more women into not just selling online, but selling in the areas that are most profitable. Um, and last, I want to highlight platform financing. So we did find that women are not using uh, online financing options through Jumia as often as men. So that's an opportunity not just to you know, help women entrepreneurs, but also to grow the burgeoning fintech market as, as well. Um, and so there's definitely um, an opportunity to kill two birds with, with one stone there. Um, great. So, so last slide. And just before I hand over to our other speakers, I want to close with a reminder of what's at stake. So $15 billion in potential market between 2025 and 2030 means that for every year gender gaps persist, billions of dollars are left on the table. That's money for the sector, but that's also billions in the hands and the wallets of women entrepreneurs. So bringing more women online and helping them succeed will only lead to not only lead to sector growth, but also ensure that women can be leaders in the digital economy. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Alexa. Um, so if for people who do not know, this Check About Live conversation was inspired by the IFC and Jumia report, um, parts of which Alexa just went through. Uh, you know, so we are going to be focusing on how more African women can participate in the e-commerce sector. So I want to start with um, Ms. Bukola because she is an entrepreneur, a entrepreneur and a Jumia merchant. Um, so my first question for you is, can you tell us some challenges you faced as a female entrepreneur in e-commerce? And can you also let us know how Jumia has been pivotal in helping you overcome some of those challenges? Thank you for having me. I'm happy and delighted to be here. I want to speak on one of the challenges I face as a female entrepreneur. One of the challenges I faced as a female entrepreneur was balancing responsibility. I need to take care of the home front. And at the same time, I need to attend to my business. To the glory of God, I'm a mother of three. I have to take care of them. And at the same time, I need to manage my business very well so that my business and my family did not suffer. Jumia has been very helpful in managing my business side. They've been very helpful. Basically, they help me in three major ways. Warehousing my products. They have a special package called Jumia Express. You can warehouse your item with them since you are 
one of their partners. So after warehousing the products, when I have another on my store, they do the packaging and the logistics and they do the delivery to the customer. And this has helped me to reduce my storage costs and delivery and operational costs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, another question for you is, what opportunities are currently available to you now that you wish you had um, access to sooner? Um, you know, so for example, you've mentioned something specific that Jumia has helped you with, right, with storage and how Jumia Express is useful to you. But are there currently any existing tools um, or services that you are now partaking in that didn't exist at the time that you started your business? And um, what would you have wanted to see at that time that you are not having access to now? I hope that question is clear. Yes, yes. Okay. At the early start of my business, most of the funds are from personal savings, family and friends. It's difficult to obtain loan from the bank because it requires a lot of documentation and some will even ask you to bring some collaterals, which is not available. But now, with Jumia Lending Partners, I have access to fund at reduced rates, which I wish as in how to have been, let's say when I was starting my business, assuming I have this opportunity, this will have allowed me to grow faster and help me to expand my scale. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just ask a question about um, how you've been able to overcome challenges connected to accessing capital to help your business scale, especially as a female entrepreneur? Okay. And now, Jumia has a partner, as in they have a lending partner. If you have, if you need any fund, you can call them they will look at you, they will look at your profile and they will give you a loan at a very reduced rate. A very reduced rate, which you, as in this, I've access to this and this has helped me to scale up and grow my business faster. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll come back to you, but still staying on the conversation around Jumia, um, I do have a question for Chairwoman Juliet Anama. Um, can you tell us how Jumia is helping women, especially um, your, I guess, your most active and prolific merchants on the platform, how is Jumia helping them harness more opportunities, right? And what are some of the biggest hurdles that are yet to be tackled when it comes to increasing women participation in e-commerce? Um, thanks, Karamone, for the question. And uh, I'd like to also thank uh, Bukola, uh, one of our sellers and partners for joining this, this panel. Um, so, I mean, the, from the report, uh, just to give, give a bit of more context, I mean, it comes very clear, very, very clear that one of the ways in which um, more women getting access through e-commerce can grow their business is actually participating on platforms. I know a lot of women are on social commerce, but when you're on social commerce, you're a single player, you're, you're not aggregating data that can be used to help you, for example, when you want to apply for a loan or something. What Bukola is, is describing is the fact that there is access on Jumia uh, uh, database on the sales history and just transaction history. This is what the lending partners can use to provide lending to her. So really, really it's about participating on platforms because then you can aggregate information, you can get access to training, which is free. We're not charging a, a women sellers for those training facilities and so on. So that's, that's the first thing in terms of uh, your second question of how do you really get more women into is shifting them from social commerce to e-commerce uh, platforms. Number two, uh, your first question is around what are we doing? Many things. So the first thing is really about awareness. Okay, so growing a lot of awareness about women, making sure that we're getting uh, you know, uh, the lessons from this report that we're disseminating into women so that they understand 
um, how the levers they use can actually significantly grow their business. So getting into more um, high value products, she mentioned, uh, Alexa had mentioned electronics, for example, but there are other high value products as well. Women tend to enter e-commerce with the same traditional categories that they do offline. So they're selling fashion products. So they stay in fashion products. Whereas they don't immediately realize that, look, all of a sudden I have e-commerce, it is blind, gender blind. And so I don't have the same kinds of issues I might have if I was operating in an offline environment where people would say, ah, can a woman sell this? Or no, I don't think a woman can sell that. All of a sudden you're, you're operating online. No one knows if it's a man or a woman. So they haven't explored using that medium to do more things. So that's the first thing. The second thing, of course, is accessing a lot of the training, show up for the trainings that are free. And then thirdly is, of course, using the, the, the platform and your own transaction history to access uh, uh, Jumia Lending. Something we have started to do this year um, is the, uh, we are following this report with IFC, working also with its separate IFC team. We started a training for women specifically around how they can understand their financials better. Because I, we believe that part of the reason why women don't take up lending uh, uh, opportunities is because they don't understand how to read their account statements and also understand their financials. So we're developing a curriculum for that. In fact, the, I think the training is going to start this month if, if, I'm, if I'm not wrong. And then secondly, given the challenges that happened with the pan pandemic around supply chain, we're also putting a training for women around how do you manage your supply chain more effectively? So we're piloting it in Kenya. And then of course, after that, we would of course deploy to other, other countries uh, where Jumia is operating. So this, these are ways in which, which we're helping women. I think the last point I would mention is we're also deepening penetration in, in locations that are outside capital cities. So for example, today, almost 30% of our consumer deliveries are in rural areas. So we're making sure that we have the network that supports sellers so that they can reach consumers everywhere, whether they're in rural areas or, or they're in capital cities. We have pickup stations that are there available for people who are not digitally literate. As most of you know, we also have JForce, which is an independent agent network that also helps people who are not digitally literate. So there are multiple things where we're putting together in the basket to support uh, getting more women on, onto, uh, yeah, onto our platform. Thank you. Thank you so much. So it sounds like, um, I mean, you, 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 you mentioned how, you mentioned that a, a lot of um, female entrepreneurs don't know how to like read their financials, right? So it sounds like there is a gap in education where um, when it comes to specific business things like writing a business plan, reading your financials, understanding how to break your account down, right? Um, so it sounds like that is a hurdle that Jumia is work, working to tackle, right? By then introducing a way for women to learn how to tackle these problems, right? Um, the second question we have is based on information that was revealed in the report, right? So the report reveals that there are two ways to achieve growth in e-commerce that, and Income, so excuse me, there are two ways to achieve growth in e-commerce and one of it is that more women need to start selling online and then their sales have to perform almost as well as that of their male counterparts, right? So you mentioned that most, in most cases, women tend to gravitate towards traditional um, uh, uh, commerce categories like fashion, hair, beauty, which is fine, right? Um, but we also understand that they are, that means that they're being left out of more profitable business categories, right? So what is, if you're, if you're able to share, what is Jumia's short and long-term approach to tackling this problem of growth, especially where female entrepreneurs are concerned? Yeah, thanks, that's a, that's a great question. So the first thing is really, it's for women to look at the fact that look, um, unlike offline, I think it's, a great part of it is, is the habits and the cultures and the ways of doing things that we've done traditionally offline that people are simply uh, bringing online. Where are, you know, instead of looking at online as a completely different me medium. So whereas offline, it takes a while for you to open one store and then open the other store. There are certain uh, uh, 
uh, requirements. You have to find a new location. You, you've got to pay your rent for two years in advance and all that. But on online, you can have 10 stores. The woman can have two stores on fashion, two stores on health and beauty, two stores on hair products, three stores on electronics. Okay? Men do it. So that's, that's the first thing. Recognize that you can actually have multiple uh, stores online, depending on your level of appetite. And like Bukola said, your own home situation and how much your, your home situation can allow you to absorb and you still utilize the, the services that are, are provided. So these are the ways to do it. Hair products, we, we want hair products too because consumers want them. We want um, uh, fashion products too, consumers want them. But to balance and to also increase the scale and the size of what you're doing, which eventually leads to higher sales, higher prof profitability, you can have multiple stores uh, on, on Junior. Our platform uh, you know, is, 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 is that easy for you to start one as well as start 10 at the same time. So this, this is a very important point uh, that women need to, uh, to, 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 to have at the back of their mind. It's not like offline where it takes you a while because there are infrastructural gaps that you need to deal with, get, finding a place, paying rent, uh, fixing, up, fixing it up, and so on and so forth. No. Um, I, I really love that analogy of, you know, offline, you have to worry about rent, but online, you can have multiple stores that you can manage, right? So it gives women, female entrepreneurs, the freedom to dream big and to perhaps um, go into uncharted territories that are not traditional to women entrepreneurs. Um, my last question for you um, before I circle back is, um, according to the report, many women use e-commerce to overcome barriers to their participation in the labor force uh, due to the flexibility that e-commerce allows, and then also to supplement existing income. How is Jumia keen into these motivators to provide more opportunities to women-owned businesses? Yeah, I mean, every day um, we are increasing in terms of a uh, number of categories, like I mentioned, that uh, any, 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 any seller can have on Jumia. And we are open to whatever categories a woman, woman wants to uh, uh, you know, sell on Jumia and offer to consumers. So one is, there's a vast array of categories you can sell. A woman can decide to be in fashion. A woman can also decide to be in solar home products. Everything is there for a woman to, to do that. And that way they can expand uh, their business. Uh, second one is what I touched on earlier is the training is very important. The training that we're providing, uh, I talked about how we're enhancing that training this year, specifically around women needs. And thirdly is, 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 is some of the services that, um, that uh, Bukola had mentioned. So now, even, even, a, even if a seller has uh, goods that are ordered outside of Jumia platform, as long as it's a seller that is on Jumia platform, you can still leverage our logistics to get those delivered. So for example, if a woman is selling on Jumia and also selling on social commerce, and she has an order from social commerce, doesn't have the means to be able to deliver it to, to the customer, we can take care of that for her. Okay. So they, these are ways in which we are, um, we are providing more and more opportunities, uh, increasing the, cap uh, the capabilities we have available so that uh, women can take advantage of them and be able to grow, grow their business. Thank you so much, ma'am. You shared some very insightful points with us. Really appreciate it. Um, so I want to move um, to Anne now. So just for context, Anne leads the integration of gender into IFD's projects in Africa with a specific focus on reducing gaps in women's employment and access to assets. So Anne, my first question is, what is the role of strategic partnerships in closing the gender gap in African e-commerce? So for example, how has the partnership between the IFC and Jumia been very crucial to achieving this objective of closing the gender gap? Thank you, Karomone, and it's a pleasure to join you today and the, um, my fellow 
panelists on this very important topic. And this is also a very important question and the role of strategic partnerships cannot be overemphasized. Uh, partnerships play a very important role in bringing together different expertise, expanding knowledge and evidence for the business case. And most importantly, scaling up impact. You bring together partners that each of them can plug in with a different expertise and area of operation and that way you're able to massively um, scale up impact and address multiple challenges and multiple gaps. Let me give you a very good example uh, of, of what we are currently doing and, and where this uh, topic and the research that um, Alexa so eloquently uh, presented stems from. Digital to Equal is a global partnership and a perfect example of what can be achieved when like-minded partners come together with one common goal. The program, what we call a peer learning platform, brought together 17 leading technology companies spanning across the globe from the United States to Africa and South Asia. This partnership was able to share knowledge and undertake some cutting edge research, uh, part of what uh, Alexa just presented, and best practices among partners, but also provided that, that research provided much needed data on the business case for investing in women in e-commerce platform. And this kind of information supports businesses in developing strategy, but also opens up opportunities opportunity for new investment in this space. You've seen the opportunity that, you know, there is in Africa, you know, Jumia alone may not be able to do that, you know, massive research covering different geographies. But when you have partnerships that bring in the right resources, the right expertise and investment to be able to undertake that research, then Jumia can take that data and that research and use it to inform its strategy and expansion across this market. Now, more partnerships are needed, not just in private sector, but also in the public sector. And I'm glad that you know we have Masi who leads Kenya's uh, regulator in the e-commerce uh, uh, space. And this is very important because governments can help remove the legal and regulatory bottlenecks and enable businesses to expand in this space and also enable women to access um, uh, e-commerce and also other digital uh, services as well. And especially not just in the area of connectivity, but think about data and insights. We need think tanks. You know, we, we have we've seen some very you know experienced think tanks do some very good work in other areas, but can we have more of that now in this space as well? We also need to massively scale up capacity building. Uh, for women, especially in non-financial services, you know, digital literacy is the number one barrier when it comes to women's ability to adopt um, internet usage and to adopt new mobile technology as well. So the area of training also needs um, a lot of partnerships to cover the millions of women, you know, the massive geographies and in places like Africa, where we also need to get in the less literate um, populations into the new internet age we need to scale up training in digital literacy. So I, 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 in, my, in, in my conclusion, I would say that it's multiple partnerships that are required to address multiple areas to be able to bring more women and men into the digital space. Thank you so much. Um, my next question is, um, which African countries would you say provide a strong example for other countries who are looking into helping their female population thrive in e-commerce, right? And what can these countries that are on the outside looking in learn from, from, I mean, according to you, I mean, according to what you know, according to your expertise, you know, which African countries are doing really well in including women in that, in that conversation and what can other countries learn from them? Good question. And there, there are a couple of these that I could speak of um, from Nigeria to Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, you know, South Africa, the three countries plus one that have been covered uh, by IFC's research. But when we talk about performance in terms of, you know, reducing the gender gap, because we are far from closing uh, the gen gender gap, it's important that we first look at the fundamentals. You know, Sub-Saharan Africa has the second largest mobile internet internet uh, use gender gap at 37% um, second to South Asia. And this is quite substantial and it has remained unchanged since 2017. So it, you know, it, it, it 
it says a lot and it says that not much has happened to move the needle in terms of getting more women to either access devices you know use internet and and this is just like basic minimum uh, to having more women entrepreneurs uh, to get online we think about connectivity and Marcy put it really well uh, that you know we don't have con connectivity where it needed most think of rural Africa women in rural um, areas in Africa they are the most excluded we find that in urban areas in Coromone, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of Lagos because when I come to Lagos, there's so much energy in, in the commercial space. You find that there are a lot more women that are connected in Lagos than they are in rural Nigeria, and that gap needs to close. Then it can, when it comes to access um, to enabling devices, and let's talk mobile uh, devices here because these are the primary way that most people in Africa access uh, the internet. But this access remains very unequal and, and women are being left behind behind and they're less likely to own and use mobile technology because of this uh, lack of access. In looking at countries that you know ha have made some strides in reducing the gender gap, we see a strong connection between mobile ownership and internet usage. So let's look at a few. Number one is South Africa. It has the least um, ownership gap in terms of uh, mobile ownership at 4% and a usage, internet usage gap of 19%. Nigeria, the ownership gap is 7% and the internet usage gap is at 29 percent and this is according to the latest report by gsma and kenya has a mobile ownership gap of five percent and the internet usage gap is at 34 percent so when you look at those trends and these are the country we could say they're a bit advanced but when you look at those trends you can see the gap seems to widen from ownership to awareness and to adoption of the internet and the key differentiator here is how fast women are adopting mobile internet and how countries are tackling the two top barriers and that is uh, digital literacy and affordability you can have all these things but it, it's futile when you cannot utilize them uh, in countries where these barriers are lower um, i.e. South Africa at 4% in terms of uh, access to, to, to mobile phones and 19% and, um, in terms of usage, you find that those women also tend to use more services online. So for instance, in South Africa, the gender gap in terms of use of services online. So you find that you're either selling on Jumia, you know, you're doing online banking, you know, you're, you're streamlining movies on Netflix. The gender gap there is only 3%. And this speaks again back to both literacy levels and affordability as well. So we could say that there are countries that are doing well, but the gender gap still is alarming and concerning. There's a lot more that needs to be done, but obviously a few lessons to be learned in terms of closing the ownership and usage and in terms of also access to more services online. Thank you so much. That was a really, really in-depth um, response. Um, so my last question is around the IFC's finding on e-commerce, on the e-commerce fit into like the context of women, right, in Africa, women entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs in Africa, right? Um, I mean, from 2020 up until now, what are the biggest challenges um, you think that women face, and how? where these challenges in, impacted by COVID, specifically the global lockdown in 2020? Thanks for that question. I think it's the last two years, it's become very clear that we cannot underestimate the, um, the, the, the disproportionate impact that the pandemic has had uh, on women. And indeed, it has eroded many of the gains that had been achieved over the years in reducing inequality. But it has also shed light, a lot of light, on what was wrong in the way women were participating, whether it's in employment, for instance, and it has greatly exacerbated challenges and barriers for women entrepreneurs. Um, IFC um, 
uh, conducted research focusing on the on, on COVID's impact on women, micro, small, and medium enterprises. You know, just across board from medium to, to from small from micro to uh, to medium, and we found that MSMEs were really hit the hardest, with many reporting revenue losses of over fifty percent, and are unable to continue operations, so they had to fold as a consequence of of the pandemic. When you look at the workforce uh, side of things, um, McKinsey reported last year that women's jobs were found to be almost twice as vulnerable to the pandemic as men's jobs. And the ILO, the International Labour Organization, just recently, just end of last year, released its workforce participation uh, report, and it estimated that 4.2% of women's employment was eliminated. It was wiped out as a result of the pandemic between 2019 and end of 2021. And this is compared to 3% of men's jobs. So more men stayed in the workforce than women did. And uh, we saw some of the reasons for this were, you know, the increased care responsibilities as a result of the pandemic that again falls disproportionately on women as well. But we also saw that, and this is where it gets really critical um, when it comes to thinking about what a return looks like. How do we revert this kind of impacts on women? The pace of return to employment for women is expected to be slower. And that means it's going to take a longer time um, to revert to where we've worked pre-pandemic and start the journey again and the number of women in the men in, in, in employment is projected to return to pre-pandemic levels this year and to be pers pers uh, i mean uh, to, to be very specific the number of women is expected to be 13 million fewer so while the men will get back to status quo by the end of this year, there's going to be 13 million fewer jobs for women than they were in 2020, uh, in 2019. And the question there then is, why is this so? And this is because women are tend to be overrepresented in the most vulnerable jobs, in the most vulnerable sectors like hospitality. And just think about all those hotels, you know, on the beaches along the east or the west coast that had, you know, to shut down. Think about of those jobs in travel as well. You know, the tourism sector alone is a huge employer of women. And these kinds of sectors will take a very long time to come back. Think about manufacturing and the number of women that work on, you know, on manufacturing factory floors. Now, the manufacturing sector needs a lot more investments. It needs to stabilize the global supply chains to be able to spur growth in manufacturing sectors. And what that means is that it takes much longer to get those women back to work and start growing those jobs um, again. And now to your question what needs to be done. We need to get more and high quality jobs for women, especially in the real sector. And in those sectors where, you know, th those sectors that are very male dominated, like energy, so that when you have future shocks such as the pandemic, you can have more women staying in work. And when it comes to entrepreneurship, we need to accelerate women's access to critical assets such as finance and um, the lady who just spoke before me was was very articulate on you know the barriers when it comes to access to finance and markets as well to be able to open up opportunities to spur women's entrepreneurship again post the pandemic let me give you two examples of how we are working on these two issues on the employment side we're working with our clients and private sector partners to improve workplace policies to attract and retain and move more women to higher paying jobs to leadership jobs and to more technical roles a good example is our energy to eco peer learning platform where we are working with the renewable energy companies to get more women into the workforce and most importantly to get more women into the higher paying technical roles that are on demand because this is where if you think about winding down a company in energy you want to retain your critical you know human resources and those tend to be the people in the technical roles so we need to get more women into these roles as well on the access to markets for uh, women Women entrepreneurs, we are exploring how we can expand access for women, access to private sector 
contracts to women um, entrepreneurs in Kenya and across the globe. And one of the things that, uh, you know, got us thinking about why is this space not explored? Why is it that women still cannot access private sector procurement? Is the data that we have um, globally, we connect international, one of our partners in this work estimates that just 1% of global private sector contracts go to women-owned entrepreneurs. In Kenya, where we have kicked off this work, we, um, we, we launched a research last year and it showed us in Kenya where you have a very strong and thriving private sector with many of the multinational headquartered here, huge and very big uh, local companies, just 3% of procurement from those companies is going to women-owned businesses. So you can imagine what would happen if you expanded this access um, in, in a country like, like Kenya and you had more women being able to supply the private sector. They'll probably pivot from selling fashion items and beauty you know, items on Jumia to start doing you know, high-level, high-ticket contracts for the private sector. So we all have to work together and think innovatively and look at what opportunities haven't been explored on the entrepreneurship access to market side of things? What are the barriers that are preventing women from accessing critical assets like finance, de-risking women-owned businesses? How can we work together to do that as well? And getting more women back into the workforce. How do we ensure that women are not overrepresented in those vulnerable sectors, but look at the sectors that can provide more stable job, stable and high paying jobs for women? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, just really, really great responses. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, so I'm going to move on to Alexa now. <clears throat> um, so Alexa, like I said earlier, serves as disruptive technologies lead at the IFC, where she leads a team advising the private sector on how inclusive technology can open new opportunities around the world. So, uh, so my first question to you is, aside the $15 billion increase in value that will go into the industry, what are the intangible benefits that the continent can expect from closing the gender gap? Absolutely. So I think for me, the value of an enhanced seller base isn't just about the numbers of sellers going online. It's about bringing in more diverse products and services that serve a wider market and more customer needs. Women entrepreneurs can be an important part of that because they have access you know, and histories in different parts of the market. Um, and additionally, of course, in the today's conversation, we've really been focusing just on the entrepreneur side of the story. But of course, that's only half of the puzzle in a, in a marketplace. Women are also buying online. And offline, at least, we know that women are responsible for making the vast majority of consumer decisions, whether that's where you get your groceries, how to provide or how to provide health care. Um, and so actually, under, I think one of the next steps for us and you know, for, for the market more broadly is understanding what do women consumers want? How can we better serve them? How can we make sure the women who are just coming online and have lower access you know, to mobile phones um, and other forms of, of the internet actually see e-commerce as a way to suit their needs. And so that, that's how we can help grow the market and help make it more diverse. Um, speaking of diversity, right, um, because I know that there might be some people who, who may push back on this conversation centering around female entrepreneurs, right? Some would say that tech is gender neutral right? Everyone has access to technology, quote unquote. So why the focus on women? Why is it important that the spotlight is on women? Great. I think one of the motivations for this report is precisely that. We, we know enough that tech not to say very definitively um, that technology may be intended to be gender neutral, but its impacts absolutely are not. And there's a whole host of reasons for that. Um, women don't have access to the fundamental tools of the digital economy in the same way that men do, whether that's around affordability or social norm. So that kind of creates a barrier to entry, but also um, men and women have different work patterns, different life patterns. And so that means the type of services that, that they need and benefit for are different. Stepping outside 
a little bit from the e-commerce world, we've seen this across many different sectors. Um, in the fintech world, for instance, we know that women are less likely to automatically use kind of a mobile service, even all the way into things like you know blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Um, women are only about 6% of crypto investors. So there's a huge gender gap and we, um, that we need to make sure to, to close that now before the digital economy grows, not 20 years from now when it's going to be a much harder ch um, ch challenge to tackle. Um, but also looking on a more positive side, there are ways that you know, the digital economy can benefit women and help overcome challenges. So for instance, we do a lot of work in the ride hailing space. And one of the things we found there is that where, where women have mobility challenges and transport challenges, ride hailing can actually help them get access to work where they might not otherwise feel comfortable transporting or just things like you know, working better hours later at night because they know they can get a safe ride home. There are lots of very subtle but very important dynamics that makes it really essential that we're not just looking at, oh, what does technology do to a market? It's we need to look at men, at women, at other vulnerable and other underserved populations. Thank you so much. I love the last point you made, and I think this also ties into the conversation around strategic partnerships, right? Are more organizations, especially larger organizations, thinking about working together to ensure that women are included in the conversation, right? So that means, like you said, if they need to work late, is it possible for an Uber or Bolt, for example, to say, you know what, let's come into partnership with Jumia, let's come into partnership with the IFC and see how we can um, ensure that women are, you know, moving back and forth as safely as possible, knowing that they are vulnerable to, um, you know, security threats after a certain time, especially in a lot of African countries. Um, so before we move on to the audience questions, Alex, I do have one more question for you. And this is about um, speaking to us about the differences you're seeing in success rates for fem female entrepreneurs in countries like Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, and Nigeria. Now, Cote d'Ivoire and Nigeria are both in West Africa. Kenya is in East Africa, right? Um, what are some dramatic differences you're seeing, right? How come women are more successful in some parts of the continent and um, in other parts we're seeing that female entrepreneurs are struggling to get access to capital, to the help that they need to get their online business thriving? Um, what do you think um, just in your own research and understanding? Absolutely. If, if I can even broaden your question, um, I think it's interesting to look even beyond Africa, because we actually did two reports, one focusing on Africa and one focusing on Southeast Asia. And in Southeast Asia, the e-commerce context is totally different. It's way more established. The markets are much larger. Connectivity is much higher. But what was really interesting is that when, despite these differences, when it comes to women, there were many more similarities than differences in terms of women's participation. Um, they tended to be a lower participation, have be kind of more stuck in the SME space rather than the biggest businesses. And that really tells us that, you know, of course we need action from the private sector, um, but that actually, you know, some of the big picture issues that Mercy really started us off by talking about need to be addressed to kind of overcome these barriers. Um, and when it comes to, so for instance, you know, um, honing back into Africa, we have in Kenya and Nigeria about 50% of women selling online, um, but in in Kenya, um, we have a lot, we have super performers amongst women entrepreneurs who are actually really driving overall sales. So we know that there's a group of women there who are really just like getting out there and, and kicking it. Um, I think the where more attention needs to be paid is in Cote d'Ivoire, and that's for a number, number of reasons. First, kind of, I think e-commerce overall is, is a little bit more nascent, um, but also that's where we see other gender gaps in terms of financial inclusion, in terms of labor force. Um, and so, you know, what we in what's happening in the broader economy is, of course, going going to be reflected online. And I think it all comes back to you know, to sum up what we've heard from a number of panelists today, um, like four, kind of four really key things, access to finance, as, access to like the basic tools like computers, management software, so women can actually get out there and compete on a level, something like a level playing field, um, kind of the business skills and confidence. And finally, like the social norms that, you know, women, you know, are entrepreneurs, they can sell anything anywhere. Um, and that's particularly true online. Thank you so much.
Um, Chairwoman, Julia, would you like to say something? Because I was actually going to ask you a question next. <laughs> yes. Yes, okay. uh, thanks, Karamona, yes. There's a, a key point which Mercy had mentioned when she was giving her keynote around, um, you know, public, uh, she mentioned, you know, the, the blockers and so on. And public policy is a very key one. That gap that we see in the GSMA report between ownership and access to internet, a lot of it is from ownership of smartphones. So women tend to own feature phones, but they don't own smartphones, especially when you start to go into rural areas and um, cities that are outside of the capitals and so on. So here's where public policy can be extremely useful because if you don't have tariffs, if government now decides to lower tariffs on smartphones and match it to smartphone penetration. So if you had smartphone penetration of 20%, for example, you say, okay, we're gonna remove tariffs or gonna lower the tariffs on smartphones so that we can push smartphones and make it more affordable for a larger population, at least until you get to a certain level of penetration, let's say 70%. 70% is my benchmark of saying that's at the point where you can say, yes, we have a significant number of population who have access to smartphones. So manage it. So how government uses tariffs to drive this adoption is one, one very critical way to actually uh, uh, make it happen. In addition to other investments that um, uh, will be very useful for uh, increasing adoption. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I do wanna stay on the topic of JForce, which you said is your a agency um, yes. network, right? Um, so are these people that do agency banking, right? Um, cash, um, POS and things like that, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, yeah. So I wanted to ask about the role um, that accessibility to fintech solutions, whether software or hardware, what role does it play in ensuring that women are included in conversations, um, right? Uh, we, 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 did a, we, we wrote an article about a startup called Money Africa, and they revealed to us that a huge percentage of their agents are actually women, right? So it, it, it is interesting that um, these traditional financial roles were not initially opened up, opened up to African women, but it seems like there's some progress being made there, right? Um, so in, in Jumia's history, how has access to financial services or financial service solutions been able to pull women in, right? In, especially into jobs that they felt like maybe they couldn't do in the past. Um, I think I'll, I'll sort of flip the question slightly into how has um, adoption of e-commerce in a way uh, been able to create new types of roles and jobs that women have found themselves um, easier uh, to take up or, or, or have found opportunities to take up. And JFOS is, 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 is a very good example. Like it's very similar to the agent, banking agent network. We started it over 20, 20, uh, 2012 when we launched. And, and we launched it because you find that not everyone is digitally literate. Not everyone has access to a, to a smartphone. And even everyone who has access to a smartphone may not know how to use a, a smartphone, uh, may not know how to operate when you get to a, an app and how you use an app and all that. So JFOS plays a very critical role of education onboarding customers and also even in some cases helping customers to place certain orders that they are not able to place on themselves if someone is not literate in english for example you may not be able to uh, to place an order and a jfos agent can do that so it's been a a, a great opportunity for uh, some women uh, to also supplement their income uh, learn for the first time how to do certain things outside of the home environment because you'll be speaking to customers, you're acquiring new customers, you're onboarding customers, you're helping them to place their orders, you're, you're training them on how to use digital tools and so on and so forth. So that's, that's been a, a very critical. I think it serves those two purposes, one in terms of increasing awareness and adoption, and secondly, uh, uh, an opportunity for women to, to enter new workforces and to play new roles that you know, traditionally they haven't found themselves uh, doing before. Thank you so much. Uh, my last question for you is, what are some of the challenges Jumia has faced um, in, for example, setting up shop or getting more women involved in Francophone Africa versus maybe any success you've seen in West Africa or in East Africa? 
Um, I'm not sure. I think it's more, um, I mean, every country is different. The social norms, the cultural norms in the, in the countries are, uh, are totally different. Otherwise, the, I would say that the, the systems we have, uh, our services, the way we set up our operations, we have JFOS uh, in Nigeria, as well as in Francophone countries. We also have a logistics services. Everything is very much similar. I, was, I would say that possibly the only difference would be um, in terms of the social norms and cultural norms that exist in, in different parts of, of, um, of Africa. And also, to, I mean, to be fair, we, we started in Nigeria first. Okay, so there is also a historical lag in terms of when uh, e-commerce, uh, when we launched e-commerce uh, in, in certain countries before we went into others. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, really, really good response. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are learning because I'm learning a lot. <laughs> um, so, Anne, I have a question for you. What can you just share maybe one or two economic benefits of increased gender equality in business? I mean, apart from the obvious ones um, that it, you know, adds to the country's um, GDP and ob obviously representation as well, because we do want to see more women in business. But can you share any more benefits with us that have come up in your studies or in your research with the IFC? Sorry, I just realized I was on mute. And indeed, there, there are very many benefits um, for you know investing in reducing the gender gap. And I think um, Alex has just really pointed one out very, very well in terms of the opportunity that exists in investing in uh, women's access to e-commerce. I would just would like to point out um, where we work, uh, our core business in addressing uh, women's access to finance. And our Banking on Women facility just, uh, you know, celebrated 10 years, not too long, um, just the last year, actually not too long ago. And every year we do undertake and look at data uh, from our um, financial intermediaries. And one of the very key um, insight that is coming out from our work um, with uh, financial intermediaries is that women are much better payers than men, like the NPLs and non-performing loans for women for four years straight have been lower compared to those of men. And that just goes to say that, you know, there's an, a market, an explored market out there that banks and other financing, financing organizations can explore, not just for the sake of expanding um, their market share, but also in building strong, sustainable businesses when you you're working with customers that actually uh, help you reduce your NPLs and at the same time helping you expand into new market shares, market segments rather. Thank you so much. Um, can we speak about the role of um, customer acquisition, right, especially for women and um, entrepreneurs who are in, who, who are running businesses in rural areas, right? Um, where it may be harder for them to get new customers or even reach new customers, right? Um, do you have any tips or any possible solutions that um, organizations like the IFC or Jumia can possibly explore to, to widen the customer reach for these women? What strategies that can, can companies can deploy to reach more women? And is this specific or in, in a broad spectrum, whether it's e-commerce or... Um, specifically e-commerce and specifically women in rural areas who are trying to get their businesses off the ground but may not have the capital or the ability to get more customers just because of where they are, location, and you know some of the challenges that they're facing there. Number one, um, and this was articulated very well, is alternative sources of financing. Jumia has done an excellent job in, in partnering with financing um, uh, organizations that help eliminate the traditional barriers that women face in formal uh, financing um, space. For instance, excessive documents, requirements for collateral, and we do know that this is a huge barrier for women. So looking at alternative uh, financing that can help help women access finance. For instance, mobile, um, mobile finance in Kenya has been a huge benefit for women. Women are able to borrow and finance their micro and small businesses. And a good, I, I, I just want to quote um, research that was released two years ago by the Central Bank of Kenya, trying to show the link between, you know, access to mobile loans, small mobile loans and lending, expanding lending for women owned businesses. And what that research found out, which was very insightful, is that women were borrowing fasting in the morning. So they 
they wake up in the morning to run their micro businesses and they were borrowing small funds and they were repaying those by the end of day so that they are able to borrow again the following morning. And that trend was, you know, enabled women to stay afloat on a day-to-day -day basis, especially those that were borrowing um, small micro um, type of loans. So expanding and looking into other innovative and alternative financing um, mechanisms is very, very important. And then the other thing around uh, addressing digital literacy barriers, and this is one of the areas that, you know, uh, Google, for instance, and, and I must commend them for the work that they're doing across the continent in, you know, reducing that gap, because a lot of women will either own um, a mobile device, but they will not have the knowledge and awareness to be able to interact and to, 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 um, to get to use the internet beyond maybe just mobile banking, they wouldn't have the knowledge to, you know, to enter the e-commerce space. So reducing and closing digital literacy gap is very, very important and companies do need to invest heavily in that. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you. Um, so, Bukal, I have a question for you. And um, obviously, you can speak into your personal experience as a Jumia merchant and as an entrepreneur, right? Um, why do you think it's important for women to not only be represented in e-commerce, but even in leadership, right, across um, um, commerce, e-commerce, business, entrepreneurship? Why do you think it's important? Um, and you can pull from your experiences as well as as a merchant, right, um, and what that has done for you, not just in business, but also in your personal life as well. Please, can, can you please can you use... me? Would you like to take it again? Okay, sure, yes, no problem. Yes, again. Um, so I was asking, I said, um, just in your own experience, from your own experience, why do you think it's important for women to be represented, not just in e-commerce, but across leadership roles um, in e-commerce organizations, even just commerce speaking more broadly? And can you tell us how being a merchant, um, a junior merchant and a female entrepreneur, how it has impacted your personal and business life as well? Okay, thank you. I'll, let me start with the benefits of e-commerce. For me, it has given me a wider reach. Wider reach. I'm able to sell to different type of people because I partner with the right people, Jumia. I'm able, from here, I can get another from my store and the person will be far, far, far. We may be from Medjugorje or Apucha, while I reside in Lagos. I don't need to worry about the logistics. I don't need to worry about the delivery. Jumia will do everything for me. And this has increased my sales. It has increased my revenue. And it has increased my standard of living. At least I'm able to do something for my family. I, will, I want to say women should participate in e-commerce because it gives them more time to take care of their family, to attend to other things. It helps us to balance our responsibility as a woman. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I love that you highlighted that Jumia is able to take your product or what it is that you're selling to further places, regions that maybe you may not have been able to go into if you were just operating on your own. So thanks for that, um, Bacola. Um, Alexa has a question for you. Um, <clears throat> just, I mean, just based on the work that the IFC is doing, uh, can you just speak about trends that exist, e-commerce trends that exist in Africa compared to other regions? Because you did talk about another report that you guys did as well um, that was focused on South, Southeast Asia? Is that what you said? Is that, if I'm not, right. yes. Right. Um, so yeah, so can you talk to us about this, how the trends in Africa, where commerce is concerned, whether social or e-commerce, and how it compares to other trends, similar trends that you're seeing in other regions? Well, I think there's two ways that Africa really stands out. Um, one is, as you've already said, is social commerce. Um, we found, found that um, women's use of social commerce in conjunction with e-commerce was different from men. So women first tended to get started more on e-commerce and then also tended to use e 
uh, tended to get started on social commerce, but also tended to use social commerce while still running Jumia, their Jumia shops. This tells us that actually, um, like th that, is, that actually makes women more powerful sellers because they can use a variety of tools to reach a different customer base. Um, and so I, I think that particularly stood, stood out from Africa where, you know, the Facebooks, the, social, um, the WhatsApps were really where um, a lot of action was happening. Um, but we need better ladders to help more people kind of make the transition from one to the other. Um, the other one that's come up a little bit in our conversation already is fintech. And um, everything from, you know, um, mobile money on, I think is um, Africa really does lead the world in many ways in terms of different forms of adoption of, um, of, and of mobile money and other tools. And that is, is something that, you know, gives us an opportunity to have easier forms of access um, than, than where a lot of regions start out with kind of starting selling with, with a credit card. Um, so I think there's some good opportunities to, to build on there to kind of leapfrog into the future. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the um, FinTech point because, I mean, Africa does have, compared to other regions, very low card penetration rates. Specifically, um, even when you're looking into West Africa, you notice that people are rarely using their cards because cash is still king, right? So I guess um, opening up those barriers and ensuring that women are able to learn how to access these tools, how to use them, would mean that more of them are going to get into the e-commerce and selling online um, space. So thank you so much for that. Um, so before we get closing remarks, there is one question here, um, I think that are kind of connected, but, um, but this is for Chairwoman Juliet. One person is asking about the training process, how she can be a part of that. I believe that she may have to be a Jumia merchant, if I'm not incorrect. And there's another question about um, the demographic picture of people who are accessing the loan facilities that Jumia provides in terms of gender. Um, so are, we, are you seeing more women access these loans or more men? Is there a gap that exists? Okay, yeah, sure. So, um... Your, your first question, uh, please forgive me. What was the first question? I remember the second um, question. Yeah, this is Chinanye. Chinanye asking how one can be a part of the training process yeah. that you mentioned. Sure. Yeah, so the training is provided on our platform. So clearly it's for people who are right, sellers who are registered on our platform. But I just want to highlight the fact that there is, we don't charge any registration fees to register on Jumia. So there's no, no real... Uh, reason why anyone who, who, who has uh, the interest and wants to sell on Jumia cannot start. You register, we even start with seller onboarding training, and then subsequently we do a lot of other training, training you how to do paid, paid advertising promotions to boost your business, training on, um, on how to manage traffic to your store. There are multiple types of training that we can offer, but like you said, yes, you have to be registered as a seller on Jumia. Um, the second one is, is uh, it, it's a question around the gender differences and, you know, how men and women are taking up fintech products on, on lending services, to be, to be precise. Yes, indeed, men are more are naturally more bullish when it comes to taking up loans. And we found through the report that more men were taking up uh, the opportunities of lending on the platform. So that's why we're also, you know, raising the awareness for women that, look, you can, you can use uh, the same access uh, to lending uh, opportunities that are on the platform and you can you can grow your business uh, much faster. I mean, Bukola also gave her, uh, her, her own history and, and, and how she's been able to use those lending facilities to make it work for her business. Thank you so much. Um, any final thoughts from you, Chairwoman? Um, no, I think, I think Mercy had captured it in her initial uh, a presentation where she talked about this. This is this is a, a, a something that both private sector and public sector need to keep working collaboratively, collaboratively together. There are things which we can do, uh, things around uh, services we can provide, awareness training, uh, bringing in more partners that can support women. But there's also a whole lot that can be unlocked uh, through simple public policy, uh, public policies that only the, the, the public sector can do. So that continuous um, uh, partnership, 
with the likes of IFC, providing the research and providing the insights to say, hey, have you guys looked at this? This is the kind of insight we're getting. Maybe if you concentrate here, you can actually drive more adoption. So it, it, that tripartite uh, collaboration is something that I need, I think needs to happen more of. We started it with IFC. Now we need to bring, in, bring on board the public policy uh, makers on board as well. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, Mercy, any last thoughts, any closing remarks from you? Um, thank you very much. Um, my closing remarks would be that um, in the conversation around women and participation in e-commerce, we need partnership and collaboration across the various actors now more than ever before. And let's look at this as a round table and everybody has a seat on that table to make it happen. Policy certainly can be a very big impact, but if policy is not informed by investors, users, the women themselves, the financial institutions, and all other critical actors, then it will not be responsive policy. And I believe we can do it with partnership and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much. It looks like partnership and collaborations are the key words for today. Um, Alexa, any, any closing remarks from you? Um, yeah, I just want to again remind everyone on the scope of the opportunity here. Like, we really do try to find opportunities to, you know, drive social and development impact while, you know, supporting the private sector. And I think this is one of the most clear cut cases we've come across. We can put billions in the hands of women entrepreneurs while growing the market and getting access, consumers access to a greater variety of goods and services. Um, nothing to complain about there. And I, I see a, a lot of room for potential moving forward. Thank you so much. Um, Anne, any final words from you? I, I think for me is just to emphasize that e-commerce provides a huge opportunity to spur women's entrepreneurship, especially in Africa. As Juliet so articulately um, uh, described to us earlier, it already helps to remove the traditional barriers, you know, logistics, um, you know, premises and all that. But we just need to address the few two to three barriers and get more women selling online and also help those women expand beyond the traditional lines of business when you talk about, you know, beauty and fashion. And we already saw that one of the things from um, the report by IFC is that women working on the junior platform are able to expand even to start selling electricals because nobody thinks about the face behind an online platform and you can get to the higher value kind of um, sectors like electricals and others so i see this as a huge opportunity collaboration is needed but definitely this is the future for women entrepreneurs I love that. This is the future for women entrepreneurs. I really, really like that. Thank you so much, Anne. And finally, Bukola, any thoughts from you on what it means to be an entrepreneur, especially a female entrepreneur in Nigeria? Okay, thank you. For me, I would like to talk to some female entrepreneur. E-commerce relieve you from every unnecessary burden. You need to come to hey commerce. Your products must be known. I partner with the right people. I have more than two store on Jumia. I have the necessary training through Jumia and I'm able to grow my sales. I have wide assortments. Female too can sell electronics, I sell electronics with the right training and I made a lot of sales. Women who can enjoy this opportunity. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so we have come to the end of this very insightful, I knew this was going to be an insightful conversation and I'm glad that, um, you know, I was not disappointed. I don't think anybody else was. So a special thank you to the team at um, the IFC. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for joining us and agreeing to speak with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you to our attendees for joining in. And um, I've noticed that some, a few of the attendees also put in some important reports and links in the chat box so you can check that out. Um, thank you to the IFC for your support. We really, really, really appreciate it. And we're hoping to see even more reports, not just from the IFC and Jumia, but like um, Chairwoman 
said, even more organizations as well who are willing to close this gender gap, this gender disparity that exists in e-commerce. Um, our chat room moderator, Sultan, dropped a post-event survey link in the chat box. So please, would love to make our event even better. So please click on that and give, share your thoughts with us. Please be as honest as you want to be. We have very thick skins at TechAbout. Um, once again, this event was put together by the Tech About Insights team. This is Tech About Data Research and Intelligence Unit. So they provide actionable data on startups and the tech ecosystem across Africa to investors, entrepreneurs, big tech companies, regulators, just anyone who is interested in how technology is impacting people and businesses in Africa, you want to go to Tech About Insights. Um, and they also put together this event and they also threw events on behalf of Tech About. Um, and then there's the TC Daily newsletter that I mentioned earlier at the start of the conversation. Um, if you want comprehensive a comprehensive roundup on what is going on every single day in the ecosystem in Africa, you want to sign up for this newsletter. If you go on our website, you can use this link here, but if you go on our website, um, you, there's a section called newsletters and you can click on that and you can read past editions so you get a sense of what we talk about and you can go ahead and subscribe. Thank you so much and we're really glad you enjoyed the conversation and we hope to see you again at our next conversation.